Welcome to The Great Reveal. Pictures of Jesus in the Hebrew Bible with Dr. Richard Booker. In Luke 24, Jesus said that everything written in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and Psalms was about Him. This means the Jesus story begins in Genesis. How can this be? The story of Jesus' life revealed in pictures throughout the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. When you see the pictures, you see the person of Jesus. And when you see the person, you'll see yourself because you become part of the picture. Join Dr. Booker for these insightful teachings as your spiritual eyes open to see what was hidden is now revealed in each message of this exciting series. The Feast of the Lord and... uh, this whole series we've had for over two years now are pictures of Jesus in the Hebrew Bible. And the the big deal that I try to explain to Christians and Messianic Jewish believers too is that the Hebrew Bible is a picture book. It's a picture of a person. The challenge we have in our modern Western world is God painted these pictures in an ancient culture that we don't understand. So we don't know the pictures are there, so we don't see them. So we think that somehow Jesus did away with his own pictures. That doesn't make any sense, does it? So he looks at his picture and says, well, I don't need that anymore. I'm here. That doesn't make any sense. I mean... I've been living with Peggy for 55 plus years and I have her picture in all the rooms and when she walks in the room I don't turn down her picture. (laughs) Hello, I better not (laughs) if I want to live with her another year. So these are pictures and we learn the person better by looking at the pictures. And so we all need pictures. One of the most beautiful, powerful, clearest pictures of the Messiah is the Feast of the Lord. And so sad that along the way, these were stolen from the Christian world by bad teaching and theology and anti-Semitism and all kind of things. But God is awakening a remnant of believers all over the world. Amen. That's the good news. And when Peggy and I started teaching on these things in 1974, we could meet in a phone booth and have room left over. And now God's let us live long enough to be able to impact many thousands of Christians all over the world who are hungry for discovering the roots of our faith. So it's a blessing to be here this evening on looking for Jesus, Yeshua, if you prefer, in this last feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. And so we've got these beautiful slides. Look up here, it's the Feast of Rest and Joy. Can you say that with me? How many of you need a little bit of that? Rest and joy and Sukkot. Can you say that with me? The Hebrew word Sukkot, the booth, the shelter. So why is this called the feast of rest and joy? Because it's the last feast on the biblical calendar. And all of these are based on the agricultural season. They didn't live in big cities you know, in in apartment buildings and condos, you know, these were rural agricultural people. And so the feasts are based on the agricultural season. So you have Passover, you know, the spring festival, Pentecost or Shavuot, the summer festival, and Tabernacles or Sukkot, the fall festival. So it's the last one. Tabernacles really is the whole false, false, fall feast season, including trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. It's it's the tabernacles fall feast season. This is the last of the actual feasts. 
And so what happens is on the agricultural season, it's at the end of the agricultural season. And so all the hard work has been done, all the harvest has been brought into the barn, whatever you're gonna have, it's there. You got a few days off, you can kick back on the front porch and have whatever it is you're drinking <laughs> and enjoy the blessings of the labor you've had all harvest season. So it's this feast of rest, rest, enjoy celebrating the goodness of God that he's helped you bring the harvest in for the season. So that's why it's called, in my calling it here, the feast of rest and joy. So uh, Sukkot, uh, it's also called the feast of ingathering because again, you've got all the harvest in, see? Feast of ingathering. It's also called the feast of booths because God's gonna have them dwell in little shelters as we'll look at here in just a few moments. So this is the last feast and prophetically, we'll look at it here at the end of the teaching, it represents the end time coming of the Lord feast along with trumpets and atonement. So we'll look at that here in just a moment. Since God uses the natural things to teach us spiritual truths, see, because this is the last of the big harvest for the season, it tells us there will be one great end time harvest of souls before the coming of the Lord. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. So that's, that's the real news. Not what you see on television and in the newspapers and on the internet. The word of God has the end time news and there will be a great end time harvest right at the end of the age before the coming of Messiah. And this pictures that prophetically, see? So let's look at it here a little bit. Let's look at the next slide. Now here's your favorite book, <clears throat> your favorite chapter, Leviticus 23, verse 39. On the 15th day, what day was that now? 15th. On the seventh month, so that's that's going to be on our calendar, September, October. That's when this comes in the fall. <clears throat> when you have gathered in the produce of the land, so you, you've got all the harvest in, you shall celebrate. Well, hallelujah. How many of you like to celebrate? So this is celebration. That's why I, that my feast book, I entitled it Celebrating Jesus in the Feast of the Lord. So you're not really celebrating the feast as an end result. You're celebrating him through the expressions of the feast. You see what I'm saying to you? Celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. So that's 15th to the 21st, seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest. That's one of those high Sabbaths. Remember, there's high Sabbaths. If you don't know that, you'll be all confused about when Jesus was crucified and buried and resurrected. You, you'll get all confused about that because it's based, he did everything on feast days. <clears throat> and on the eighth day, so God throws an eighth day in, shall be a solemn rest. A high Sabbath. So tabernacles is seven days, the 15th to the 21st, but he throws in an eighth day as the big wrap-up day to start all over again. We'll look at that here in just a few minutes. So then verse 40, and you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, that's that translation, branches of palm trees and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook. You bind them together, you see in the picture there. And you shall rejoice, see, rejoicing. Rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. Okay, so the feast of resting and rejoicing. Now through the Messiah, of course, we can internalize all of these truths and enjoy a good measure of this right here today. Amen? 
But this, this is a, a practice for what's coming. Tabernacles are dwelling in booths. Peg and I are in that picture somewhere because, you know, we took groups to Israel for Sukkot for 30 years. This is a picture at the Hyatt there on Mount Scopus, the northern part of the Mount of Olives. Usually the hotels in Israel during tabernacles, they decorate the dining halls to look like a sukkah, you know. So Leviticus 23, 42 to 43, you shall dwell in booths or little shelters for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So let's talk about this slide for just a few moments. <clears throat> God told them to make these little shelters. And it was a, a looking back reminder that even though their ancestors wandered in the desert for 40 years, God took care of them. Their shoes never wore out, ladies. They didn't have to go to the Sinai Mall to get some new shoes and new clothes. They could skip that part of the journey. So even though they were in this terrible place for 40 years, wandering around, Big and I have taken groups to the Judean desert. It is really desolate. It's not a walk in the mall. We had to carry a lady out on a stretcher one time from St. George Monastery to the bus because they didn't understand when we told them 70 times, you, you may not want to make go on this hike here. It's not a walk in the mall. This is the Judean desert we're going into. <clears throat> so look, it looks back. It, reminder that they're pilgrims passing through and uh, even though they're going through life God is going to take care of them but they made the roof of these sukkahs loosely constructed so you can look up and see the stars you can see the heavens you can see god up there you know and it's a reminder of not just looking back but looking ahead to father abraham who was looking for a city whose builder and maker is god amen a new jerusalem so this is the deal it looks back and it looks forward god took care of you in the past He's going to take care of you in the future. He's got something even better in the future than he had in the past. And this is all going to be a picture of it, a visual aid, you see, a picture. So exciting here. There's two rituals during the Feast of Tabernacles that are important that Jesus, Yeshua, was part of. And he's going to use these as visual aids. Now, the miracles that Jesus did, he did them, of course, out of compassion and mercy and love for people. <clears throat> but he did them as signs on certain feast days, usually. Not all of them, but many of them were on feast days <clears throat> because he... He, he didn't just randomly do these things that he did. He did them in a way that the people would know what he was doing. We don't get it because we don't know their customs. We don't know their traditions. We don't know their rituals. But the things that Jesus did weren't just, oh, well, I believe I'll stop and talk to the lady here at the Samaritan well. Here, you know, He did things that were connected to the world that the people lived in so they would understand what he, he was saying and doing. Oftentimes people will say, well, Jesus never said he was the Messiah. He never said he was this. He never said that. The people who say that have no idea what they're talking about because <laughs> they're looking at him as if he was doing something in a Western world. 
all the things he did. He didn't have the T-shirt that said, I'm the Messiah, see? They sold those for almost nothing. Anybody could get one of those. But would you rather have the T-shirt or the guy who could do it? So, so he did it. <clears throat> and he did all these things in a way that the people of his time connect aha that's what that's about see so they knew exactly what he was doing who he was claiming to be when he did some of his major acts of redemption in the bible <clears throat> so he, he's going to come in matthew 11 some of you remember this verse he said come unto me all you who labor and are heavy laden and i will do what i will give you rest wow that was a big red flag word rest oh tabernacles rest see they knew exactly <clears throat> what he he implied by that so tabernacles one of the three feast seasons when all the hebrew men families could go if they could would go to jerusalem you remember and celebrate the feast and have an encounter with God. That's what these are about, having an encounter with God. And so, in the first century, when you read the Gospels, you're going to see Jesus there for tabernacles. Well, if it's good enough for him, you know the little deal, what would Jesus do? He would celebrate tabernacles. <laughs> Because that's what he did. Isn't that amazing that we've missed it so far? So anyway, he's going to be in Jerusalem for Sukkot, for the Feast of Tabernacles. And tens of thousands of Jewish people are going to be there from all over the surrounding areas because this, this, they've come to celebrate the feast like God told them to. And they're going to have two very important rituals that we're going to look at here for a few minutes. And Jesus, he's going to put himself right in the middle of both of them. And he's going to make himself so clear that they would all know exactly what he's talking about. So this first one is called the pouring of the water ritual. Now, what's that about? In the Middle East, it's not like here in the U.S. where it can rain any day, anywhere, anytime. There's a definitely definite rainy season and dry season in Israel. So around late September, early October, you need to get some rain. Because that's when you need to plow up the ground to put the seed in the ground. These are agricultural people. So if you don't have the rain to come and soften the ground, you're not going to be able to make much of a row in hard dirt clay. You with me? You need some rain to soften up the ground. Peggy and I live out on a little farm, and we have this big garden, and We've learned a whole lot about these things by having this garden. <clears throat> what it means to have rain to soften the ground and put that seed down in there and wait in faith for it to grow. <clears throat> you know, we don't plant it one day and go back the next to get the watermelon, you know, or whatever. You have to wait for its time, amen, and its season to produce. So they have the need for rain. Every year when we are at Sukkot in Jerusalem, for all those decades, always had the big prayer for rain for the people. And so they had kind of what I would call a rain dance ceremony, ritual. So what happens is <clears throat> they're all at the Temple Mount now, and they're going down... You know, it's up high, so they're going down the southern slopes to the Pool of Siloam, and, and a special priest has a golden pitcher. See, all these things in the Bible 
have significance. So gold is a symbol of deity or God in the Bible. So this special priest has a golden pitcher and he's going to go down with a processional. See, it's a big parade of praise. It's a praise gathering they've got going on here. They're blowing the shofars and the trumpets. They're waving all these branches that we just read about. <clears throat> They're playing the harps and the tambourines. They're dancing. It's a big praise gathering of believers. That's the way we call it today. And they're making this joyous celebration down to the pool of Siloam. And the special priest with this golden, see gold, gold, golden deity, God pitcher, is going to dip it into the pool of Siloam, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And they make their processional back up to the temple mount, to the altar, and they're going to have this pouring of the water ritual asking God to send the rain. So the pouring of the water out of the golden pitcher, two scriptures that were appropriate for them here, and this is Isaiah 12, verse 3. At the time they're doing this, they're all praising the Lord. Therefore, with joy, you shall draw water from the wells of salvation. See, this is all a natural picture of something spiritual. It was something they needed in the natural, of course, the real rain, but they were looking for something greater, the rain of God's Spirit upon their parched and dry souls. Anybody need that? I was praying this morning, I said, God, come down on me and Peggy one more time before we go to see you. Let us have one more life-changing forever encounter. One more, Lord, please. The one you gave us a long time ago has carried us for a long time, but let us have one more. One more. Now, here's the scripture. Let me give it to you, Isaiah 44, verse 3. And here's, this is part of their praise gathering. God says, for I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on your dry ground. Now, that's the land, but here's part B of the verse. And I will pour my spirit on your descendants. See, that's the spiritual part. And my blessings on your offspring. So they're all there by the many thousands, maybe tens of thousands. And they're all praying these prayers. They're all singing. They're all dancing. A great big charismatic praise service. They're asking God to pour out the rain on the ground for the harvest and pour out the rain of his spirit upon them. Now, right there, as all of this is going on, John chapter 7, on that last day of the feast, See, he's right there in the middle of it all. I think this is the 21st, 15th to the 21st, the last day of the feast. This is when they're at the height of this pouring of the water ritual. They're all singing and dancing and clapping and waving the branches, making the instruments of praise to the Lord, pouring of the water ritual. And there he is, Jesus stood up and cried out, he had to have a loud voice, if anyone thirst, oh my, let him come unto me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart or innermost being will flow rivers of living water. This is, he's shouting this out at the moment of the greatest praise as they're pouring of the water. Now this he said about the Spirit. They just, we just read the scriptures. Whom those who believed him in him were to receive for as yet the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus Yeshua was not yet glorified. So here... He's using the natural 
to bring them to himself. Remember he said to the woman, the Samaritan woman, whoever drinks this water that you're pulling out is going to keep thirsting. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him, give them will never thirst. It's, she said, well, I don't have a bucket for this. We're always hearing things with our natural mind. we got to get a spiritual mind. Amen. Shalom. What a joy to be sharing with you for the next few moments. I want to tell you about one of the most powerful revelations about Jesus in the Hebrew Bible, or what Christians sometimes call the Old Testament, and that's the Feast of the Lord. You know, we've always sort of thought these were the Feasts of the Jews, but they're really Feasts of the Lord. And the most exciting thing about all of that is they're pictures of Jesus. Now, as a Christian, I can really get excited about something that helps me know Jesus better. And I bet you can too. When I saw these pictures many years ago, it changed my life forever. And that's why I wrote my book, Celebrating Jesus in the Biblical Feast, because I know it will help you in your walk with God also. Now, what you're going to learn in this book is about the feast, but primarily how they point to Jesus as the person, and also how it applies to our lives today. But there's more. These feasts teach us how we can have God's peace, God's power, and God's rest, and wow, don't we all need those things in our world today? There's also an amazing chart. It took me years to figure out how to show this chart, showing how Jesus is crucified, buried, and resurrected according to the biblical calendar, not the Western calendar, and goes through hour by hour. Just at a quick glance, you can see how it all unfolded in that last week of his life. There's also an amazing chapter on how you as a believer can celebrate these feasts while keeping Jesus as the center and focus of your celebration. And that's important to all of us. Did I mention Bible prophecy? Well, most people are not aware that the prophecies in the Bible about the end times, well, they're all based on the feasts of the Lord. Isn't that amazing? For example, Jesus was crucified at Passover. He was buried at unleavened bread. He was resurrected at first fruits. He sent the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. He's coming again at trumpets. He's going to judge the nations at atonement and establish his kingdom on the earth at tabernacles. Wow! It's all about him. And that's all in this book. Well, it's going to help revolutionize your understanding of the Bible. It will renew your passion for Jesus. It will clarify the prophetic seasons in which we're living. But you know, i got something even more for you. We've got a study guide. And you can get that study guide along with the textbook. You just sit them down side by side. And it's kind of like a tour, a self-guided tour through the book. So you can get the study guide, the book, or just the book yourself uh, at our website at www.rbooker.com. I hope you'll get a copy because it's touched the lives of thousands of people around the world. That's www.rbooker.com. Now here's the phone number if you need to call, 936-441-2171. That's 936-441. 441-2171. Thank you for letting me share with you about this amazing book that can have a big impact on your life. God bless you and shalom. So they're doing all of this. Jesus is there for the last day of the feast. He's saying, I am the reality of what you're doing here. Come to me and drink. Come to me, I will give you rest. And so oftentimes we have the, they, they can get a, can, so focused on the picture they miss the person. See, the ritual rather than the relationship. And we have the same issue in Christianity. How many of you go sitting in the church house? We heard this one 50 years ago. Sitting in the church house doesn't make you Christian anymore. Sitting in the garage makes you a car. Did you ever hear that one? So we have a lot of people who are professing Christians who have religion, but they don't have the relationship. Amen? And so this was their 
challenge as well, looking to the ritual rather than the person. So Jesus is there. He's a Jewish person. He's observing tabernacles, but he's using it to point the people to him. Okay? Now there's one more ritual here. Lighting of the temple ritual. Now what's going on here? <clears throat> they also needed the sun to moisten the ground so the seed could get life from the sun. You plant that thing down in the ground, you can't see it. But when you go down to the garden, you feel the dirt to see if it's moist, to see if it's cold, the dirt, or if it's warm. It's why you have to plant at the right time. If you plant too early, the seed's not going to get the sun to warm the ground. It's not going to make anything, see? So how about they needed the sun along with the rain to warm up the ground <clears throat> to so the seed could become a little flower, a little plant, a little flower, and some fruit on the end of it. But again, these are physical things to teach spiritual realities. So Psalm 27, 1, you know this one, the Lord is my light and my salvation. That's what Jesus' name means. Yeshua means salvation. <laughs> His name means who he is. He's the Savior. Salvation is what his name actually means. It doesn't come across like that in, in the translations. So we kind of miss some of it. So here's the next ritual. It's called the lighting of the temple ritual. What are they doing here? <clears throat> They're celebrating that God is light. And so the way they did that is they had all the four 75-foot lampstands in the temple courtyard all illuminated. But then most of the people, if they could, they all had a lighted torch. And they're singing and they're dancing and they've got their little kids on their shoulders and they're twirling around with those torches. Now, they didn't have city lights, right? <laughs> so... If you're coming to Jerusalem, it's way up high, right, on the hill, and the Temple Mount is the highest spot. <clears throat> if you're getting there after dark, you're maybe a few miles away, you're going to see the lights of the lighting of the Temple ritual. And you know you're getting closer and closer to Jerusalem. So you could see the lights not only of the lampstands in the temple courtyard but of all the people with their torches it was said that it wasn't a dark alley anywhere in jerusalem because all of the lighting of the people carrying their lamps their torches their lights whatever they had all of jerusalem was illuminated so it was an expression of their praise to god who was the light of the world for them. Hint, hint, you see that? But there was one guy in Jerusalem. This would be the next day, the eighth day, the 22nd. One man in Jerusalem who did not see all of this because he was born blind. He's there for the lighting of the ritual of the temple celebration. But he can't see any of it for a moment. Now, it's important. The words in the Bible, of course, the translations are not the original scriptures. We understand that. But the words that are in the Bible, they didn't just happen to get put there. The Spirit of God administered all of that. So words in the Bible are important. For example, born blind, 
blind from birth. Say that with me, blind from birth. Very significant. My God, let that phrase get through into the translations. <clears throat> because there were certain spiritual leaders in the time of Jesus who had uh, healing ministries. And so Jesus was not the only one who did miracles, but he did the ones that the others couldn't do. That set him apart, see. So there were some who had special giftings for healing people with eye problems. It's like we have today. People have certain gifts of the Spirit for healing certain parts of the body and why God gave them that, that's, that's his business. But They couldn't cure a common cold, but they can heal your bladder disease or whatever, you know. And so there were certain spiritual leaders who, who could heal certain eye problems that people had. But nobody ever healed anybody blind from birth. Come on, somebody, help me out. This is one of those four messianic miracles. When the big guy comes, he'll do those, you know. When daddy comes, he'll take care of that. It's too hard for the kids. When Messiah comes, he'll do these. And this is one of these. So it, by the goodness of God, he let that phrase stay in the translations, blind from birth. See, they all understood if anybody ever did that, that was the guy. <laughs> we don't get that, do we? Without knowing these things. So here's this guy. He can't see any of it. I'm sure he's enjoying it as much as he can because it's a big celebration and festival. But he didn't get to see the lighting of the temple and everybody turn, turn and turning and tossing and dancing and twirling and the lighted torches. But he met someone. Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus did some things that once again, without knowing the culture and the customs, it just goes by us. So it says that he spit in the ground and made some spittle and put it on the man's eyes. Why would he do that? That's strange. Because in his time, people understood that the firstborn, that didn't mean the one born first, firstborn is a title, it's the heir, right? It's the heir who gets the double portion and it becomes the priest of the home. That's the firstborn may or may not be the one born first, but he gets the inheritance. He gets the inheritance from his father. Hello. So when Jesus made the spittle, did like that, he's saying, I'm the firstborn of my father in heaven. I'm the heir. Father says, ask of me and I'll give you the nations in the ends of the earth for your inheritance. I'm the guy you've been waiting for. So this is one little part of the story. Then he says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Remember where they dipped that water out earlier? Now in some of your translations, it says pool of Siloam. It'll have in parentheses the word sent. It's kind of a shorthand way of saying something. It means the pool of the one who is to be sent. In other words, it's the Messiah's pool. It's not just any pool. Pool of the one who is to be sent. Go wash in the pool of the one who is to be sent. He's here. That's me, he's saying, by telling him to do that. 
He didn't say that's me, but by telling him to do that, he understood that's what this means. Now, where does the pool of Siloam get its pool? <laughs> where does it get its water? From the only living water, running water, in around Jerusalem called the Gion Springs. You might remember way back in 701 BC when the Assyrians were attacking Jerusalem, King Hezekiah diverted the water from the uh, Gion Springs inside the city walls and emptied into the pool of Siloam so they could have water and not, you know, they could survive the Syrians. They had water inside. And you got Hezekiah's tunnel which is still there today, and Peg and I have taken tour groups through Hezekiah's Tunnel, the real one right in the Bible. It's truly amazing. So, Gion Springs, because it's running water, the people of ancient times called it living water, contrasting it to a dead, stagnant pool. Now, the word phrase Gion Springs or the name of the spring means the virgin's fount you can't make this stuff up or the place of bursting forth so here is living water coming from the virgin's fount bursting forth into the pool of the one who is to be sent oh my this is much more exciting than the Super Bowl Thank you. Never seen an NFL quarterback walk on water. I'm going with the one who's already won the Super Bowl of life. How about you? You see what's going on here? All of these are little pictures pointing to the person. So when Jesus tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam, all of that is understood. This coming from living waters, coming from the virgin's fount, bursting forth. If I go wash in the pool of the one who is to be sent, I'll be able to see. And then Jesus used all of that and said, I am the light of the world. Wow. Wow. See, all of that is behind that one statement. I am the light of the world. I'm the light that's come in human flesh to reveal the Father to you. So these were the two main rituals. Pouring of the water ritual, the lighting of the temple ritual, and Jesus used both of them to point the people to him as their true source of rest and joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. So all of that is going on, and all of this we can miss, obviously, if somehow this has been cut off from our Christian development and education and teaching and knowledge of the Bible. Ezekiel 37, 27, and 28. My tabernacle also, also shall be with them. See, God doesn't want to live in heaven forever. He wants to come down here with us. And you know, if you're a believer, your home is not heaven. Oh my. Dr. Booker's really stirring up stuff. No, you're going to be there until we all return here and God makes a new heaven and a new earth where indwells righteousness and we will live with like Adam and Eve forever on a new earth with God. Without the curse, hallelujah. Amen. So that's what this is about. My tabernacle, my sukkah. I'm going to make a sukkah. It's called planet earth. Hallelujah. 
And I shall be with them, yes, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord to sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. And then Revelation 21, 3 gives the picture of, of the person connecting with Ezekiel. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Hallelujah. So God crossed over the threshold of time and space and tabernacled among us in a person. The English comes out, you know it, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled among us. In fact, the Bible calls our bodies a tabernacle. This is where our spirit lives. And so Jesus came the first time to tabernacle among us to be the innocent substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. But he's returning, hallelujah, as the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root and the offspring of David, hallelujah. And the end time fall feast tells us all about this. So let's look at the next slide. Here it is, Revelation 19, 11. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Verse 16, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So let's just keep that up there for a moment. So <clears throat> the feast, fall feasts, they're the pictures of the end time prophecies. So trumpets is coming to make war. Now in the Bible, we don't have, God, when God gave the Bible, it didn't have chapters, okay? Thank God for verses and chapters, right? So we can find things. But, you know, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, those chapters are not in the way God gave it. It just helps us find things. So it just continues to tell one story. So 17 and 18 is the final judge, final warfare of the new world order, economic, political order. Revelation 17 and 18 is called Babylon in the Bible. <laughs> Culminates in 19, which is uh, atonement coming to judge the nations. And so chapter 20 talks about the Messianic kingdom. That's what Tabernacles is a picture of. See? But remember there was an eighth day? What's eight mean in the Bible? You know what that means. New beginnings. Well, guess what that is? Revelation 21 and 22. <laughs> I'll make all things new. See? So, you know, some Western theology of end times, if, if it's cut off from this, it's not going to be accurate. It's all the prophecies of the coming of the Messiah, his first coming and his second coming are based on the feasts of the Lord. It's so rich. You can spend decades studying this one thing. It's always more to learn. Uh, here's Zechariah 14, 16. So if somehow somebody tells you that Jesus did away with all this stuff, well, this is the future right here. This is what all believers are going to be doing when the Messiah comes. It shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem. See, this is 19 and 20 of Revelation shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and do what? Keep the feast 
of tabernacles. <laughs> we need to start practicing. Now let's look at the next slide real quick. Come celebrate the feast. Here's Isaiah 51, 11. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord, is that you? Shall return and come with singing unto Zion. That's Israel, Jerusalem. And everlasting joy, there it is, because it's a tabernacles. Shall be upon their head, they shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning. Hallelujah, shall flee away. Now look at these pictures. Peg and I are in there somewhere. In 1980, when uh, Israeli government decided to move their embassy to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv and make a statement, the cowardly nations of the world who had their political offices in Jerusalem moved out in a protest. 1980, some people who would become friends of ours later decided that they were going to take over one of those vacated buildings and establish a spiritual embassy, a Christian embassy for Israel. And the first thing they did was to host a Feast of Tabernacles because that's what it's all about, coming of the Messiah, Tabernacles. So they've been having that since 1980. Peggy and I were blessed to take groups there for 30 years. Somebody posted on Facebook uh, yesterday a picture of me baptizing her in the Jordan River. She was, and then today she posted her baptismal certificate that she says she has hanging on the wall in her bedroom where I signed it, you know. And so I was blessed by God to be a lead teacher for 18 years of those 30 years. Now, what does that mean? In Zechariah 14, we just read that people from all the nations will come to celebrate tabernacles in Jerusalem. So every year, there's usually, the last few years, it had to be an online festival, you know, Zoom stuff because of the virus issues. But every year, there's usually over 5,000 Christians from 100 nations there. And it's encouraging that I just said that, but it's also sad that very few Christians even know anything about it. And this is what we're going to be doing when the Messiah comes. So Peggy and I were so blessed. God said to me one time, you can never go to a hundred nations. I'll bring them to you every year in Jerusalem. Isn't that amazing? And there in the big Binyanauma, the civic center, the big meeting hall that holds thousands of people and all the overflow rooms with the big screens, 5,000 people plus from 100 nations. Everybody comes, you can see in their native costumes from all over the world. You wonder, how did that person ever hear about this and how did they ever get here? Because it's not cheap to get there. You know, unless you live, you know, in Europe close by somewhere. But to get there from the U.S., it's expensive. And you had people from little places I never even heard of. Strange costumes, you know, coming from all over the world. God sovereignly touched their hearts and awakened them to what I'm explaining to you. That's how they got there. No human orchestrated this. But this is what's called the Jerusalem Parade. And um, you can see all the people and all the flags and all the costumes and the nations. One year... They had the, the flyover, you know, with the helicopter flyover, and there's all the parade down below. And unbeknownst to me and Peggy, we were leading the entire parade with a great big giant American flag that was on the front page in color of the Jerusalem Post. You see all these people here, thousands of people. Now, what's going on here 
is since this was the feast God gave to the Jews first, the Israelis have their companies in the parade too. So you got the Tel Aviv Light and Power Company, you know, things like that. But they don't have the color and the costumes and the banners and the flags and the dancers and the, all of these things. So they're, they're, they don't have the colorful part of the parade. But you will have like 5,000 Israelis in the parade representing their companies and 5,000 believers from 100 nations in the parade, 10,000 people in the parade. Plus another almost 100,000 lining the streets cheering you on. This is why spiritual leaders said if you've not been to Jerusalem during tabernacles, you don't know what rejoicing is all about. Try to visualize yourself being in a parade in a foreign country with all your costumes and flags and banners and shofar blowings and dancing and singing with 10,000 other people and 100,000 people lining the streets waiting for you. You cannot hold back the tears of joy. The hardest hearted person melts in these parades. In the early years, the Israelis didn't know what to make of all this stuff. All they knew from Christians was anti-Semitism through the ages. So it took them a while to figure out what are these, what are these people up to? Why are they here? But over long periods of faithfulness, they, they started warming up to us. And the last few years we were able to go, we all meet in this big park, a few blocks away from where the parade starts. So you've got these thousands of people from all over the world trying to find their nation. We try to find our state flags here in the U.S. Rhode Island's over there, the big Texas groups down there. Finland's over there. They all got their flags, their costumes, singing their songs, dancing all over the park. And you had to wait three or four hours, you know, it's like Moses trying to move them out. It's not easy to get all those folks organized. So it used to be that, you know, there's people are waiting for us several blocks away. But the last few years, it was so amazing. I can't, I can't hardly talk about it without getting so emotional because you, re, you relive all this stuff when you talk about it. They were so, the secular Israeli people were so excited for us to be there. So excited for the parade. The last few years, they couldn't wait. They started coming down into the park where we were all assembled and making their little lines. So we would have to walk through a little small space so we could all touch each other as we went through. That's the change in their attitude and thinking about reaching out with unconditional love to them. And of course you, have your little flags that you give out to the kids. And over time, the kids they get used to all this, you know. So they know you've got all these flags. They want to get your flags. So you have to hide them in your pocket somewhere. They'll grab all your flags. And so the parents will let the little kids run out there. Can you imagine running out there in the middle of all this great big parade? You pick them up, little Israeli kid, stroll around with them, give them a 
flags in the back to their parents. And for just a few hours, these people who have known nothing but hate from Christians, just for a few hours, somebody loves us, finally. And they have some shalom, some joy for a few hours. And they begin to realize these are what real Christians are. People who love us. And have spent all that money to get over here and tell us this. And show us. This is what we're going to be doing when the Messiah comes. Don't get mad, not our Western holidays. Those aren't in the Bible. This is what we're going to be doing. So Peggy and I have had the blessing of practicing for about 30 years. So we know a little bit about what to do when he comes. And so, you know, we build our sukkahs every year when we can and have our little tabernacles out on the farm. And so all over Israel during Sukkot, people are building their little shelters out on their porch and patios. They go out there and some, the real hardcore wouldn't spend the night all week out there, but when you're a little, not, you want to be a little more comfortable, you go out and have your dinner out there. Go back into your bed. The coming of the Lord feast, feast of joy and rest. But again, we can have a little taste of that right here. That is a big part of it, but right here in your own soul. Because Messiah comes to give us rest and joy in our souls. Amen. And when we respond to him in the way he wants us to, we can have a spiritual experience of tabernacles right here now and look forward to the big one when Messiah comes. Amen and amen. Can you give the Lord a hand clap? Shalom again, everyone. I truly hope you were blessed by the teaching. It's such an honor to share it with you. And I want to give you some information here now that is ways that we can work together, not only to help you in your walk with God, but take this important message. If it really means a lot to you and it's helping you, you can partner with us to help bring this message to so many other people all around the world. In this modern electronic age, it's amazing with such little effort how we can reach so many people with the Word of God. So let me tell you a few things that we can do together, okay? Number one, you can go to my website at www.rbooker.com and you can order so many different things that will help you really for the rest of your life. There are many, many books there. Many of them have study guides. You can order them right from our website. You can study them on your own. You can use them in your home groups. You can use them in your Sunday school class. It's so easy and they're really well balanced and focus on Jesus and they give you a Hebraic cultural understanding of the Bible. While there, you can go to our resources tab and check out our courses that we have with the Institute for Hebraic Christian Studies. IHCS is much simpler to say, has all these courses listed. We have uh, students from all over the world who take them, and you can take these courses yourself. We have a free download. Did I say free? Oh, absolutely. It's called The Root and Branches. If you go to your app store, it's an amazing multimedia presentation of the basic core Hebraic teachings in the Bible. It's got the PowerPoint pictures. It's got video, audio. It's a beautiful presentation, and it's free for you. Just go to your app store, type in Root and Branches, and it'll come up for you. If you're interested, you could contact us about hosting me and your church or congregation or home group. We still, at our young age, travel all over the world helping people. And if it's possible, we'd be honored to come and speak to your group. Now, we're making these videos uh, 
for you at no charge, and we're glad to do that. But uh, if you want to partner with us and, and be a part of this ministry, you can join with us and help us uh, by being a financial partner, and we'll use your funds to help reproduce more of these products, get them distributed all over the world, prepare people for the coming of the Messiah. So you can join with us financially through PayPal by making donations from our website or the old fashioned way, you know, with a check or money order. You can send the sounds of the trumpet. We'll put that on the screen for you at 4747 Research Forest Drive, 180-330, Spring, Texas, 77381. We'd love to hear from you, love to have us work together, do something bigger than what we can do for ourselves. And so let me close this way by giving you this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom. God bless you.